is Jack McCall. Thank you. Oh, thank you very much. I grew up in a small town about 45 miles from Nashville, Tennessee, in a part of the country, and in a time when we were required to say, yes, ma'am, no, ma'am, yes, sir, no, sir, please and thank you. And if someone was remotely older than you, you were required to say or call them by Mr., and because we're from the South, we said Miss. And so the heroes in the community where I grew up were called Mr. Reese and Mr. Marvin and Mr. Sam A. And the ladies that we love were Miss Beatrice and Miss Johnny May. And we never called our parents by our first names. Y'all, I can't get used to that. For a two-year-old to call their father Jim, I just can't. At our house, it was not allowed. One night, we were sitting at the supper table, and in the South, that's what we eat at night, supper. And my brother Dewey, the youngest of the four boys, was seated two seats from my father, and I reckon he just decided he would try his wings. He looked down at my dad with half a wink and said, Hey, Frank, pass the beans. You should have seen the bug eyes around the table. I mean, the older brothers were speechless. My brother John, who was seated between my father and my brother Dewey, who had just said that, leaned back like this. <laughs> That was to miss the elbow because my father reached for my brother, laid his big hand, big as a country ham, out on top of his head, and he gathered up all the hair on the top of his head, and he straight-armed him out of the seat. Just held him up like a fish on a stringer for about a second or two and then sat him down. Now, where I'm from, that's called communication. <laughs> message delivered, message received. Not a word was spoken. My brother didn't even cry out loud. The tears just found trails down his face. Subject forgotten. Two weeks later, a little boy over spending the night. You know, that's a big deal. Back in those days, someone was spending the night. Introductions being made. This little boy turns to my brother and says, What's your father's name? My brother Dewey reacted like he'd sat on a straight pin. He straightened up and he said, His name is Frank, but don't you call him that. Because he'll pull your hair. Incredible. My grandfather was the most eccentric man I've ever known. He's the only man, only one of two men I ever knew in my life named Herod. You know, there's a lot of weight baggage that goes with some names, you know. Most mothers don't name their sons Herod or Pontius. Not too many mothers will name their daughters Delilah or Jezebel. They're just, you know... If that's your name, I apologize, but you know, there's just a lot of weight that goes with the name. My grandfather's name was Herod, Will Herod Brim, but everybody called him John Reuben. Nobody knows why. My mother doesn't know why. He was so disappointed when my mother was born that she was a girl, he called her boy till she was seven years old. She remembered the day they changed. She called him John Reuben. He called her boy. One day she said, I was standing on a flat rock. She showed me the rock behind the house. Said One day I looked at him and said, John Reuben? He said, what do you want, boy? She said, I've decided not to call you John Reuben anymore. From now on, I'm going to call you Papa. She said he did not acknowledge what she said, but from that day forward, he called her Mary Helen, and she called him Papa. <laughs> the important phrase in that little dialogue there was from now on. You know, if things aren't what you want them to be in your life, whether it be personal or professional or whatever, the great thing about this life is if you choose to, things can be different from now on. If you're willing to make the choices, implement the discipline and pay the price. We can make changes. If, things, if you're where you don't want to be, you can make changes. We did not have cholesterol when I was a kid. <laughs> If we had, we would have fried it. <laughs> and some fried meat grease. We found all these creative uses of fried meat grease. If you cut your finger, put fried meat grease. If you got chiggers, fried meat grease. Knock those chiggers out. To this generation, process is less important than results. College professor walks into class. You had one like this, I'm sure. But the one who walks in on class the first day and says, nobody makes an A 
in my class. As a matter of fact, most of you are going to see me again. But those of you who learn to sweat drops of blood might make a C, but out of 100, statistics are telling us it will be three out of 100. You know the kind of person I'm describing, the one that can brighten up a whole room by leaving it? <laughs> then he says, pop test, take the information down. At the end of the giving information, you would answer the question coming forth with. This is the information. If a duck is flying in a southwesterly direction over southern Florida at 15 miles per hour on a day when the temperature is 95 degrees, relative humidity 63% barometric pressure, 30.07 and steady on the ground, 1,800 feet below a diesel locomotive is traveling in the exact opposite direction at 51 miles per hour. There is a slight crosswind blowing at seven knots. That's the information. Now the question, how old am I? Well, everyone in the class just dropped their jaws. They couldn't believe it. Suddenly a young man in the back right where you are, sir, jumps up and says, sir, you are 44 years old. The professor can't believe it. He said, almost for 20 years I've been teaching this course, and almost for 20 years on the first day I have given information totally unrelated to the question, but what I can't believe is, you're exactly right. I am 44 years old. Would you please mind sharing with the rest of this class how you came up with that calculation? He said, yes, sir. I've got a brother at home who's 22, and he's half as crazy as you are. <laughs> and in the book, this is what John Powell said in 1975. The the pulse and rhythm of human existence has accelerated so fast that he who would keep up must run. 1975. 30 years later, y'all, 25 years later, we find that we must sprint in order to keep up. And guess what? The change continues to accelerate. What are some things that we can do along the way in the face of change that will continue to accelerate to keep our heads on straight and take advantage of this because with all change which usually creates fear there's incredible opportunity how can we take advantage of the opportunities along the way e is for having an elastic imagination two things necessary to do well in a changing world one is flexibility the other is imagination if, if we will teach our children to put down deep roots and firm foundations no matter how the winds of change blow they'll be okay I have some workaholic friends who say, well, I'd rather wear out than rust out. Well, either way, you're out. Hey, we want you in the game. We want you to stay in the game. So you can't do it all. You've got to set your priorities, right? Grandma, Grandpa sitting on the couch in the living room. Grandma jumps up and says, Grandpa, let's run upstairs and make love. Grandpa stands up and says, Grandma, I can't do both. You've got to get your priorities straight, right? As Clint Eastwood said, a man has got to know his limitations. <laughs> or I've gotten bored, gone to my grandfather, told him I didn't have anything to do, which was a mistake. <laughs> he picked up every piece of metal he ever found. He had two, three one-gallon buckets of crooked, rusted nails. He would go get one of those buckets, bring it to me and say, count you out 35 of those crooked nails right there. Take this tack hammer and straighten them out on that rock right there. <laughs> when you get them straight enough to drive, drive them in that stump right there. <laughs> That'll take up most of an afternoon. <laughs> when I was a kid, we'd start out a house in the wintertime. My mother would look at us and say, you got a t-shirt on? You need something warm on next to your body. Hey, if I told my boys that, you need something warm next to your body, they'd have a girl wrapped around their neck the next time I come. <laughs> We'd start on a trip, my mother would say, make sure you got on clean underwear. You might be in an accident. Hey, when my boys leave the house, I just hope I can't see their underwear. <laughs> we have totaled at our house, I'm talking totaled completely, four automobiles, a three-wheeler, and a riding lawnmower in the last two and a half years. No one was hurt. The most interesting story was the riding lawnmower. It was new. It was on the Jeep, on a trailer, going to a neighbor's to mow their yard. And they had solicited the help of a friend. 
and his job was to strap the moor on the trailer. And he forgot. <laughs> this is how the story unfolded. They're on the way to the neighbors. They're going up a long hill. When they reach the top, everything's fine. But when they start down the other side, my oldest son said, Dad, I looked through the rearview mirror, and that sucker was passing me on the wrong side of the road. I said, what did you do? He said, I hit the brakes and let it go on by. My 21-year-old was 18 months old yesterday. I was putting him to bed one night. His new baby brother was two months old. He was seated on my arms. We entered the room. We were dressed alike. I remembered I had on boxer shorts, no shirt. He had a diaper, no shirt. We sat down on the bed. I could hear him working out his pacifier. We called it fooler. He called it choo-choo. It was back when it was less sophisticated, y'all. It had a disc and a bulb and a handle. And he could make that thing sing 165 revolutions a minute. He could grin. It wouldn't slow down. That night as we lay in the bed, I was trying to get real quiet, disestablished eye contact. They won't go to sleep. They're looking at you because they grin. If they grin, they won't go to sleep. And as we lie there in the darkness, I heard choo-choo suction break. <coughs> he pulled it out of his mouth. What's he going to do? And then I almost missed it, but I felt it and I heard it as he kissed me on the arm. Then I heard choo-choo go back in, 165 revolutions a minute. <laughs> then without a word, he laid his chubby little hand, you know, the one with the dimples in it. He laid it on that spot he just kissed. And with all the affection a hand can deliver... He patted me three times. One, two, three. They say we baby boomers are going to live longer. As long as I have an active memory, I'll never forget the day this little boy said to me, Dad, for what you've invested in me so far, I love you too. It is a necessary discipline, y'all, in the world in which we live that's moving so fast that we maintain soft places in our lives. Find them. Seek them out. Demand that you have them so that you can not only survive but thrive with all that's coming. It's an exciting time, and I'm glad to be a part of your day. Thanks.